so he can be here for just a second. All I want to say is that if any speaker wants to use a projector, he will have to tell us that before he speaks, because he has a lecture and he will hope that improves his visibility. So my only observation to the speakers is that I urge each and every one of them to write with a very bold hand and to speak in a rather loud voice, because this is a large the topic is going to be using transparencies because at 4 o'clock today. 4 o'clock. You. So I'm going to use the mechanical one. That's the oh, all right. old fashioned one. Okay. 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 Well, thank you. I'm all wired up, as you can see. <laughs> <laughs> so it's really a great pleasure and a great honor to be able to give this talk before you for Pierre Delin's birthday. So I thank the organizers for the invitation, and I also thank them for the nice idea to celebrate the 61st birthday. Uh, we people interested in number theory should only celebrate special birthday, like uh, 51st for my friends that's next year. <laughs> 59, 61st, 67, 101, 127, and so on. So that's the only way to stay in our primes. So I, Bob Langland didn't tell the title. The title which is in the announcement is on some mysteries of Gauss sums. So I, I have to apologize if my talk doesn't quite deliver the goods which were promised by this title. When I gave this title, this was before the summer, I foolishly assumed that I'd be able to work during the summer. But I'm French, I should know that in August nobody works, right? So it didn't work out. I sent a new title some, well, a while ago, but in some way it didn't, it was not destroyed and it still appears in the, in the announcement. So the, the actual title is on a, on a local proof for the local length length conjecture for GL2. But still, I, I'd like to present you one of the things which I find mysterious about Gauss sums. And the uh, kind of Gauss sums I'll be looking at are the local factors in functional equations of, local, of global L functions, or uh, what is usually called epsilon factors. So let me take you back, well, half a century and start there and proceed to the most recent results and questions. So I'll talk first well, of epsilon factors mainly for Galois representation and those will be local things. So my base field is a finite extension of QP, the field of periodic numbers for some um, prime number P, I will need Q, which is the cardinality of the residue field of F, the ring of integers divided by its maximal ideal. I will need the normalized absolute value of F, which takes value to Q to minus one on uniformizer. And I will need a non-trivial additive character of F, where character is a continuous homomorphism. Well, about half a century ago, in Tate's thesis, where it defines, defines epsilon factors attached to characters of F cross, to such a character chi, you associate a monomial in Q to minus S, depending upon chi and psi, actually, of the form for some integer s and non-zero complex number. Here, alpha, in the following way, I'll record it briefly because it will be generalized in different fashions uh, later. You consider the sp space of compactly supported 
locally constant functions on F. It is endowed with a Fourier transform attached to psi, F psi sends such a function phi to its Fourier transform phi hat which uh, associates to x This integral, this integral is taken over f and the Hall measure on f is chosen so that uh, you have Fourier inversion formula here. And the way the epsilon factors are defined, they are defined through the zeta integrals for phi such a function. You define some integral zeta of phi of s is the integral over f cross of phi of x, uh, well, chi of x norm of x to ds, d cross x, where d cross x is some hard measure on f cross, it actually converges for real part of s large to a rational function in q to minus s. And you have a nice functional equation which defines the epsilon factor for each phi like that, zeta of phi s divided by an elementary factor L of chi s is equal to this epsilon factor z of phi hat 1 to minus s divided by L of chi minus 1, 1 to minus s, where L of chi s is 1 if chi is ramified, and it's 1, the value of chi to the uniformizer q to minus s minus 1 if chi isn't ramified. And when you try and compute such factors, you find out that they are elementary terms times Gauss sums. Hence, well, the way I consider them as uh, avatars of Gauss sums. Now, one of has to go up. Now I jump, well, some 15 years or so, and I go to the definition of epsilon factors for Galois representations. So here, I will choose an algebraic closure, f bar of f, and denote by gf the Galois group of f bar over f. Here, yes. For each finite extension e of f in f bar, I'll denote ge the subgroup of gf here, and I will also write psi e for the character composed with the trace map from e to f. It's also a non-trivial additive character of e. Now, class field theory says that characters of GF, so continuous homomorphisms into C cross, are exactly the same as finite order characters of F cross. So in this way you can define epsilon factors for characters of GF. And Langlands conjectured, proved, and Dolin gave a very nice proof using the global version of state thesis of the following theorem, where, uh, let me, if for such an E, let me write R of G for the Grothendieck group. Of semi-simple, continuous, finite dimensional complex representations of this group GF. So it, it's a Z module with a free Z module basis, the isomorphism classes of irreducible representations of such GE. So the theorem, due to Langlands and Deligne, is the following. There is a unique family of map 
of actually group homomorphisms from, so the family depends on E running through finite extension of F in F bar to monomials in Q to the minus S so endowed with multiplication such that, well first, when you take, let's say, rho irreducible of dimension one, so really it's a character of GE corresponding to a character chi of E cross, let's say, by class three theory, so I'll abbreviate it by CFT, then the factor is really the one defined in the thesis, and the second one is some um, induction property here. If I take a finite extension K of E and rho a representation of GK of dimension zero, so that's virtual representation here, then we ask that if you induced this rho from a representation of GK to a representation of bigger group GE, so that's psi E here, and here that's psi E, it should be equal to epsilon rho psi k. Here. So that's unique one here. There are very nice invariants, rather difficult to compute, and the question is how much do they say about representation? So you've defined such things attached to representations. The point is that they say much, at least about irreducible representations. So a fairly recent theorem dating from the end of the last century says this one, this thing. If sigma and sigma prime are two irreducible representations of GF of the same dimension, say n bigger than two, and assume that the epsilon factor are the same when you twist sigma by an irreducible representation rho of gf of smaller dimension, smaller than n. Then rho and rho prime are isomorphic. So in a sense, Epsilon factors do tell you. That's sigma and sigma prime. Thank you. I'm glad I have an audience. And sigma and sigma prime are isomorphic. So in a sense, the epsilon factors do tell you everything about the representation sigma. They, they determine the representation up to isomorphism. Well, it's a nice theorem. There's nothing so mysterious about it. The mystery is about the proof. The only Proof I know of this fact is through the Langlands correspondence. I don't know any direct proof. So let me hide the theorem. I'll come back to it later. And go through the looking glass, the Langlands correspondence. Langlands correspondence relates such Galois representations to entirely different kinds of objects. Those are the smooth irreducible representations of GLN F. So you consider, of course, positive integer n and this group GLNF and you consider a representation over some complex vector space W usually of infinite dimension which is smooth in the sense that every vector in W has open stabilizer in GLNV. It's a very strong continuity condition here. But there are plenty of smooth representation we'll be considering rather the irreducible smooth representation. So I'll usually drop the term smooth. 
irreducible rep for irreducible representation, choose lambda is valid. That is, a, the, the center scalar matrices in G L and F act via a character, usually written omega pi, if pi is the representation I'm looking at, uh, it goes from F cross to C cross and is called the central character of pi. Uh, I have to record some other thing. If I consider the space of linear functionals in, on W, which have an open stabilizer in GLNF, of course, GLNF act naturally on linear functional on W, then it carries a representation of GNF, which is written pi chesh, called the contragradient representation. And if pi is irreducible and smooth, pi chesh is smooth by construction and irreducible too. I need one more thing. Here is the matrix coefficient of such a representation. If you take a vector W and W, a smooth linear form in W chess, you can form the function on G, which is the matrix coefficient, uh, which to G associates the value of lambda on pi of G W, it's a coefficient. Yeah. And in more or less the same way as a general semi-simple continuous representation is a direct sum of irreducible ones. One can construct all representations or smooth irreducible representations of GLN from some special, from the building blocks, the primitive cases, some special representations of GLRF where R is less than N. And those are the cuspidal representations. The cuspidal representations are some very nice ones from which, again, one can construct all the other ones. Pi is said to be cuspidal for this talk if pi is irreducible, smooth, and all coefficients have compact support. mod, well, scalar matrices. Of course, the coefficients transform according to the central character and the, the action of scalar matrices. So it can have compact support only modulo, the center of GL and F. So the Langlands correspondence relates irreducible dimension N representations of the Galois group GF with cuspidal representations of a group GL and F. And the was proved by Michael Harris and Richard Taylor, uh, well, around 1999, the following theorem. There is a unique family of maps now depending upon the integer n, which is positive up there, from a set which I usually write gf not of n, that is the set of uh, dimension n irreducible representations of gf continuous of course up to isomorphism to another set which is the set of cuspidal representation of glnf again up to isomorphism with some proviso since i've stuck to a uh, linear group that is omega pi has to be of finite order. And that's that I write A0 F of N. There is a unique family of such maps which has a very nice property with respect to the epsilon factor such that for sigma such an irreducible representation of some dimension N and sigma prime another representation of another dimension n, so let's write this map. Sigma goes to pi of sigma. If I have to go the other way, I write 
pi goes to sigma of pi, of course, you have the following equality of the epsilon factors. The epsilon factor of the tensor product sigma and sigma prime is equal to another avatar of the epsilon factors, which turn out to be Gauss sums too. That is the epsilon factor of the pair pi of sigma pi of sigma prime defined by uh, Jacquet, Piatesky, Chapelot, and Shulaika or Shahidi. So we'll not be able to uh, define for you those epsilon factors. It, this would take the rest of the hour, but I'll give you a definition when, uh, let's say, n prime is equal to 1 in just a minute. Right? The point is that it's another generalization of Tate's thesis, which is completely different from the theorem um, Galois representations, which I've erased now. And the theorem uh, about the way that a quality of epsilon factors gives you that two representations are isomorphism is isomorphic is a consequence of this theorem here. And another result, uh, which I had proved a while ago, that is if you have pi of pi prime, two um, representations, two cuspidal representations, which share the same epsilon factor in the sense that you have this equality of epsilon factors for all rho cuspidal representation of GLRF when R is a smaller integer than pi is equivalent from pi prime. So if you know that and you go through the correspondence, then you know the result for Galois representations. And for me, it's a complete mystery and why you would have to go through this correspondence to prove the result on Galois representations. I have not seen a direct proof even for GL2. So, well, there is some work to be done. If you want some more mysteries of Gauss sum, then maybe you can look at a paper that uh, Pierre and I wrote some 20 years ago. Uh, it's in Inventiones, and it starts with Sur la Variation. It's a very long title, and there's hardly any progress. Hardly any progress has been made in the, in the meantime. So, some work then. So that's one of the, well, big and nice mystery. I'd like to have it cleared someday. Um, let me come now to main topic. Actually, I, I have a nice transition, actually. That, that would be maybe to understand more about those epsilon factors. One should look at the proofs of this theorem of the correspondence, of the Langlands correspondence, and try and simplify it and see whether we can take the arguments from the side of GLNN of GLNF to the side of Galois representation. Maybe it's possible. So, and for some other reason, we started to look at the uh, easiest case. I mean, the first case to present itself is the case when n equals 2. The proof of Harris and Taylor is heavily global and geometric. It uses the uh, cohomology of some nice Shimura varieties of the number field. It also uses automorphic forms on global groups, unitary groups over such number fields. So it's really very difficult to see how to simplify it. But when n is equal to 2, uh, there is a proof in the literature which does not involve geometry. I'm sorry, Pierre. <laughs> it still uses uh, global arguments in the guise of automorphic forms on GL2 over number fields. Actually, the, the case of GL2 was done much before. It, uh, the work of many people, some of them are in this room, and the final touch was given around 79 by Phil Katzko, and I'll just now uh, state his result in some way, which is slightly different from the result of Harris and Taylor. It's, it's only a more convenient restatement, which I will use here.
So that's three. Maybe you can count for me. You tell me when I reached four. In the case of GL2, my students always complain because I, I don't know how to count. Uh, Well, let me give you a theorem for GL2. As, as I said again, there are many people who've worked on that problem and Phil gave the last touch. There is a unique bijection. Well, did I say that those maps were bijective? Well, the symbol there uh, seems to indicate that it's a bijection, but they are bijective, really. And uh, so there is a unique bijection here from degree two irreducible representations of the Galois group to cuspidal representations of GL2F, again denoted by sigma goes to pi of sigma, such that, well, slightly different restatement of that condition. You have this equality of epsilon factors for all characters chi of f cross, where the notation is like this. If chi is a character of f cross, then chi pi, where pi is a cuspidal representation of GL2 f, simply sends g to chi composed with that g pi of g. So it's a representation of the same space as pi, whereas chi of sigma, if sigma is this Galois representation, sends g to chi twiddle of g, sigma of g, where chi twiddle is the character of gf corresponding to chi by our cluster theory. And I'd better and here, that chi is of finite order so that everything is correct on those sides. Do you have to put cuspid theory over exactly? Absolutely. I have to normalize some way cluster theory. So geometric Frobenius goes to uniformizing parameter. So in this statement, so how is that? Yeah, absolutely, yeah, OK. Plus, if n equals to 1, then sigma goes to pi of sigma is given by class field theory. You're absolutely right. We have to start somewhere. Absolutely. Thank you. So this is simply a restatement. As you see, there appears here only uh, the epsilon factor for a single representation, not a pair of representations, and this makes it easier for me to uh, tell you how it's defined. The I have several remarks, and I'm sure if I don't look at my paper, I'll forget some. Well, first, it's more or less obvious here that in this notation, it's uh, compatible with the action of the characters chi of f cross. Second is that if you consider this epsilon factor here, it's really the same as the epsilon factor for the pair chi cross pi psi. So to define the epsilon factor for the pair here where n is equal to 1, I only have to define this. So if pi is a cuspidal representation of GLNF, even n is not necessarily equal to 2, any n, you consider the space of compactly supported locally constant function on mn of f. On this space, you have Fourier transform. Well, 
where you use the character composed with a trace map on matrices, you introduce zeta integrals depending upon a function here and f coefficient of pi. This is an integral on GL and F of phi of G, F of G, absolute value of dead G to some power, which I think is S plus N minus one over two D cross G. This is a rational function in Q to minus S, actually a polynomial in Q to Vs and Q to minus S, and now I have a problem. No, I can use that, provided I put. Oh, now you allow. That's right, if, if it's OK. And if I may use this blackboard, then the epsilon factor is defined by the fact that you have this functional equation here where f chesh is the coefficient of the contragredient representation which to g associates f of g minus one. So this functional equation, which is true for any phi and f, gives you epsilon pi si. So in this way, you see exactly that it's a, well, some generalization of Tate's thesis due, I guess, to Jacquet Langlands for n equals two and to Godemont and Jacquet for bigger n. So joint work this past, what, year or so, uh, Colin Bushnell and I started working on a problem of obtaining a local proof of Katsko's result. Katsko's arguments are mainly local, except that he uses uh, references, and the reference, many of those references use global arguments. So now I can uh, announce that with Colin Bushnell, we now have a completely local proof of that result. So in order to tell you what's new, I have to tell you the story. So I have to start with what was known. What was known already, uh, say, in Jackie Langlands in the, in the 70s, early 70s, really. And known with local arguments, right? So you have to start with an irreducible representation of dimension two of the Galois group. And there are two kinds of such irreducible. First, if sigma is imprimitive, so sigma is a dimension two irreducible representation of the Galois group of f bar over f. And in primitive means that sigma is induced from the Galois group of a quadratic extension and theta is a character of the Galois group of f which I will identify with characters, finite order characters of E cross, because otherwise I will have to use too much notation. So they are the same thing for me. So this theta really is this char the character of this group. Yeah. And theta has to be a finite order. If sigma is in primitive, then one knows how to construct pi of sigma with such properties. And the second is actually that for any sigma, there is at most one good candidate for pi of sigma. So 
So the way to proceed is to prove that when sigma is not in primitive, one says sigma is primitive, that such a pi of sigma really exists, and then you have to go through the map and show that it's a bijection. And you have to do that purely locally. That's the program. How would you do that? Remember, we cannot use number fields. That's not good. Well, it turns out that it's not so hard to completely construct the cuspidal representations of GL2. Let me just give you a typical cuspidal representation of GL2. I need another blackboard. Large one. You want, to, you want me to use that? Okay. But they are small. Huh? Could they contain all cuspidal representations? I'm not sure. This one. So that's four. Well, they are obtained by looking at the Iwari subgroup I of GL2F, which is the set of invertible elements in an order. This order is a set of matrices which have integral entries and C actually is in the maximal ideal of OF. So I is really the set of those matrices with A and D invertible in OF, which has a filtration by subgroups IN of the form 1 plus P to the N, where P is the Jacobson radical of A, P is simply the set of A, B, C, D in A with A, D in P, F. Here. So you look at this uh, filtration here, and if you take an element N in the normalizer, in element B in the normalizer of I, so it normalizes also all the congruent subgroup I, M, such that the determinant of B has a valuation in N. Can you see? I hope so. Of the form minus N, N odd and positive here. Then, well, first, the extension generated by B inside of M2F is quadratic ramified. You dispose of uh, the character of IK if N is equal to 2K minus 1, let's say, with some integer. You have a character psi B of IK into C cross, which is uh, defined this way. Well, I'll make a simplifying assumption here just to get the numerology right, is that psi of the ring of integer is not trivial, whereas psi is trivial on the maximal ideal, just to simplify the matter. The normalizer is generated by I and a matrix like this. So it's not in GL2 of OF, the normalizer. There is some extra matrix which uh, switches a and B and switches B and C, multiplying one by pi, dividing the other one by pi minus one. Yeah. So if you have such an element, you get a character here. And this character is normalized by E cross. So you can form a hey. Yes. You can form a subgroup, the subgroup of GL2F, 
made out of this open subgroup IK plus some multiplicative group of this extension. And if theta is a character of E cross such that the restriction of theta to E cross intersect with IK, which is actually simply the unit of E congruent to one modulo the kth power of the maximal ideal, if it's equal to psi B restricted to the subgroup, then you get a character of E cross IK. Let me allow, let, I hope you allow me to write it theta psi B. So you have a very nice character, very simply constructed, and you have a procedure of induction which gives you from this nice open subgroup to the full group GL2F of theta psi B. So it's a very standard procedure of induction which gives you a smooth representation of GL2F and it turns out with the hypothesis here this smooth representation is irreducible and cuspidal and moreover it gives you nearly all of the cuspidal representations. Let me state it. It doesn't matter if you take the full smooth induction or compact induction you, you get the same answer in this case. But yeah, I can take compact induction if I want. Right. It's, it's a theorem that you get the same result. Yes, it's not obvious. Oops. So any sensible induction in this context would give you the same representation. So I'm still in the case of GL2. And any any cuspidal pi is of the form, well, pi b beta, b and beta chosen in some way with these requirements here and chi character of chi cross, so b theta as above. Or those are the ones I call ramified cuspidals. Or of the form chi pi d beta, where this time b is an element in the matrix which generates the field, but this field is unramified, and theta is a character of fv cross with some requirement, and there is a slightly different construction. I don't want to. Uh, go into the details. It's a similar construction, and this one is more important, as you will see right away. So you know everything. So, well, Galois representations are not so difficult in dimension two, so we can expect to just look at the Galois representation on one side, look at the cuspidal representation on the other side, and match them, right? Well, that's very easy when uh, P, remember the residue characteristic, is odd. Indeed, <laughs> indeed, this was remarked by Gerard, I think, first, and maybe some other people also, Roger Howe. And so the results were known in the 70s, during the 70s. If E over F is unramified, no, E is equal to F of B, so that the second part of the construction, the unramified cuspidals, if I can say so, 
then if you consider the representation which is induced from the character theta which is up there, then you find that it's pi of b theta prime with the, so the same e, the same here, here, and theta prime is obtained from theta by a very easy uh, formula. Theta prime is theta multiplied by the uh, order to unramified quadra quadra the order to unramified character of E cross. So minus one to the evaluation. And this way, not only do you get the Langlands correspondence, but also an explicit formula, at least for the Galois representations which are induced from a quadratic unramified extension. Well, this is also true if E over F is quadratic ramified, but tame, so P is different from two. If you start with the previous construction here, where E is tame, such a theta, and you look at the Galois represent, uh, representation which is induced by theta, then you find that it's pi v theta prime, where theta prime is equal to theta times some tamely ramified character. Explicit psych theta is explicit and tame. And you do get a bijection too. So when P is 2, it is known that all Galois representations are either of this type or of that type. So you know the image of all Galois representations when P, sorry, when P is odd, thank you. When P is odd, all Galois representations are either of this type or that type. So you know exactly, explicitly the corresponding representation of GL2 side and you know that you have a bijection because all cuspidal representations are of this type or of that type. So that's finished. So let me now stick to the case where P is 2. So beware. When P I'm sorry? Oh, it's, uh, it's of order four at most, yes. Yes. It has to be over, well, it's either of order two or at order four. So, but it's given by, uh, well, a gas sum. <laughs> so beware, let's now suppose that P is two and suppose that E over F is quadratic ramified theta, the character of E cross of finite order, such that the induced of theta is irreducible as a Galois representation of degree two. Then I told you that in this case, this representation is imprimitive, so pi, so that's sigma, pi of sigma is known. So it has to be of the form which I've given you previously. So it has to be of the form pi of b prime, let's say, theta prime for some b prime generating a quadratic extension which is ramified over f. Well, usually e prime over f is not isomorphic to e over f, which is one of the complications of the matter. Whereas in the tame case, previously, when P is different from 2, you have the same result, but E prime is isomorphic to E. So there is some complication. So let me try and make the story short. So when P is 2, now I know everything about the um, imprimitive representation. 
I told you that pi of sigma is known, and actually the map from sigma to pi of sigma, if uh, you go from imprimitive representation, it is not hard to show uh, that it's injective, at least on the set where it is first defined in primitive. There are several proofs in the literature. We've got, a, well, a somewhat easy proof nowadays. The problem is, at least to define pi of sigma, when sigma is primitive. What happens? Take sigma primitive, so it's not induced. So it's a representation, let's say, sigma of gf into gl2c, and you can look at its image in pgl2c. The image, you know, is finite. It's a finite subgroup of pgl2c, which is moreover solvable because such a Galois group is pro-solvable. We know the finite subgroups of PGL2C. We know they can be cyclic, but that's impossible because sigma is supposed to be irreducible. It could be dihedral, but the dihedral case corresponds exactly to the imprimitive representations. It could be isomorphic to A4 or S4, and the other case of A5 is impossible because it's solvable. So you have to deal with those things. So the image is either A4 or S4. If you take a two silo subgroups of A4 or S4, you see that there is a unique cubic extension, unique up to isomorphism, K of F, such that when you restrict sigma to GK from GF to GK, for which I will use the notation sigma restricted to k, when you restrict sigma to gk, then it's imprimitive. Simply because the image in the PGL2C will be the two silo subgroup here, which will be dihedral. So it is imprimitive. So the idea now is to say, well, sigma is imprimitive, so I know what pi of sigma k is, because one knows the Langlands correspondence in the imprimitive case. And possibly, one can recover pi of sigma from pi of sigma k by some descent uh, procedure. Well, is there a descent procedure? Well, there is a global one given by Langlands theory of base change for GL2, but we don't want to use the global uh, procedure. So we use tame base change. Tame base change, if L over F is a tame extension, I still have five minutes, and you start with ramified cuspidal for GL2F, you go to ramified cuspidals for GL2L, pi goes to pi k, well pi L here. And the procedure is very easy. With the previous parameters, pi is of the form pi of B theta. B is a matrix in GL2F. You consider it as a matrix in GL2L. And you compose theta with a norm from uh, L E to E. Theta is a character of E cross, and you compose it with norm. It's a theory which is well-defined. It's entirely parallel to the process of restricting a representation sigma to the Galois group of a tame finite extension. It has the same 
properties. For example, the fibers are known. The fiber of this map is made out of the representation chi pi, where chi is a character of f cross trivial on the norm from f. And at least if L over f is uh, Galois, the image is equal to the Galois invariant uh, caspitals, ramified caspitals. So you know the fibers and the image, and you can try and go through this procedure. So maybe now I have some more blackboards. Just to finish. Suppose I'm in the A4 case, so that K over F is Galois. Right. I start with sigma here. I go to sigma K here. I have pi of sigma K because this sigma K is imprimitive. This pi of sigma K is Galois invariant because this map is very nice. I mean, I even told you that from the construction, it's very easy that it's Galois invariant. So it comes from a pi. There exists a pi with pi k is equal to pi of sigma k. So there are several choices because here I have an ambiguity up to uh, an order three character. But there is only one such pi such that omega pi corresponds to the determinant of sigma. So there is a unique way to satisfy this requirement. And this unique way gives you exactly the right uh, property of the epsilon factors. And epsilon chi pi s psi is equal to epsilon chi sigma s psi. Essentially, because the epsilon factor, at least the third power of the epsilon factor is controlled here, so it makes up for an ambiguity a third root of unity. And this third root of unity is controlled by the choice of central character on one side and determinant on the other side. So that's OK. Well, two minutes to finish the uh, S4 case. It's actually more difficult. I'll tell you exactly uh, why and how we uh, have a cure. Now, the S4 case, the S4 case, K over F is unique, but it's cubic and not cyclic, not Galois here. So I have the Galois closure, pi L here, and this group is S3. So, and I have sigma, I go to sigma K, and I also have sigma L. Sigma L, pi of sigma L is known, pi of sigma k is known, and this pi of sigma l is Galois l over k invariant. So it was, it's of the form pi l, where pi is a cuspidal representation of GL2. But now, if I look at the number of representations which satisfy this requirement, there are two of them. They differ by twisting by the quadratic and ramified character. So I don't know how to choose. Similarly, if I try and compute the epsilon factors, I have a sign ambiguity here. Well, the idea would be to say, well, why don't we go back to k? The problem is that it would be very nice to go back to k if pi of sigma l were obtained. So question. pi of sigma L, is it obtained by taking pi of sigma K and base change it? It's not obvious at all. This is the place where, well, the most important place where Phil Kutzko's arguments was global. He showed that the base change, which is uh, just defined before, is the same as the base change that Bob defined. And since uh, 
the base tensor that Bob defined is compatible with global theory of their representation, you have a result. So now we cannot use that. And if you want to, comp to prove that directly, it's very hard. I've done that in a number of cases, not all, ca all cases. It's a very ugly computation. I don't know how to do in the general case. So what could you say? Well, a trick which we invented only recently is this one. Trick. Start with pi of sigma k. Write it as pi of b theta, where theta, so k of b over k is quadratic, and theta is some character of k of b. Well, a priori you don't know anything, except that you have sufficient control of the situation to know that this b, you can choose it to come from a quadratic extension of f. So can choose b such that f of b over f is quadratic. But of course you don't know anything about theta. Theta, you would like it to come from this extension of f. Well, you would like, you don't know. You force it. You force it. Define theta prime such that theta restricted to, uh, let's say, f of b cross is equal to theta prime to the third. You force it, actually. In the, you modify theta by forcing it to come from f. Well, it's not, it doesn't define theta prime uniquely, but if you impose the central character, it defines theta prime uniquely. And now, it's a miracle. This new pi of b theta prime has the right epsilon factors. It's a slight computation. It takes only a page and a half, and it's a really a miracle that it has the right epsilon factor. So it defines pi of sigma in all cases, and then you have to prove that it's a bijection, but there has to uh, be some, still some mystery. So if you want to know why it's a bijection, you buy the book. We've written the book. It will appear in the spring. <laughs> so thank you for your attention. Okay, that's right. Absolutely. Oh, it's just use the uh, the expression as a as a Gauss sum, really. It's it's a. You see, you have to only to compute some special epsilon factors, and they turn out to be uh, exactly uh, of the shape. Yeah, it's no, it's not tame, but it still reduces to uh, to quadratic Gauss sum in a sense. No, it's not. It's so it's a question of science, really, but uh, it's subtle. It does work out in the end. Yes, everything's fine in positive characteristics for local fields, or for power series fields over a finite field. Everything's the same, really. No difference. Excuse me, other question? Was there the hand? Okay, I just wanted to observe that, of course, the, fun, the existence of epsilon factor is, of course, a statement about identity between Gaussian sums. And, and if you once have the statement of the existence of the epsilon factor before you and sufficiently intelligent to recognize, as Celine did, that it's a consequence of uh, global relations between L functions. If you don't know that, then you try for a local proof. And the local proof depends basically on four fundamental cases. And uh, one is easy, one is due to Davenport Hasse, and two are due to Dwarf. That's right. And the two that are due to dwarf are stated as theorems in, I think, the published form of his thesis. But dwarf himself never published a proof. Now, the only thing I ever had in my hands 
was a borderized version of the war proof that was in the thesis of some other German uh, student. And even the borderized form in which the signs were neglected, which of course destroys the usefulness <laughs> of it, was tremendously difficult. In other words, it's an it's a, it's a analysis of Arkin Schreier equations, it's very high ramification that goes on for page and page and page. And I think if you, page after page after page, and I think even if you didn't know what the work had otherwise done, and reading even the borderized form, you persuaded that this was really a first class mathematician. There's difficult, difficult calculations. And, and basically, the reason that no local proof was ever published is that, I, mean, I think I'm the only one who tried, you know, after, maybe after the work himself, to put those very, very long calculations into a publishable form. Right? They're just far too long. And why I thought I would mention this today is, it's, as far as I know, no one has made any attempt to rescue the works computation. You don't have it, do you, John? <laughs> and, and, and if there, for example, in the papers he left behind, I think they would be of interest to those people who are still concerned with identities between Gaussian sums because so, on so that first thesis itself. I, I, they, I don't think he put the calculation in the thesis. He no. put the results in the thesis, as far as I know. Yes. As I say, we have a state supervisor here, and he will tell us, but uh, certainly in the public form, there are only, <laughs> only the statement. And he sent me this German student's uh, version. He had sent a copy to the German student, a Greek student, a Greek student in Germany. So I just think, I mean, at this moment, at least his widow was still alive, one, one might look for these papers. I think they would probably be useful. Anyhow, that's all I want. Okay. Thank you.